In Romans chapter 4 and 5, we see a powerful revelation of the righteousness that comes by faith alone and the working of grace and righteousness in the life of the believer. We're uh, making our journey through the book of Romans. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Romans chapter 1. I just want to quickly review some of the things we covered. We've covered the first three chapters. And today, we're going to do chapters 4 and 5. So Romans. I just want to review very quickly chapters 1, 2, and 3. And then we will cover chapters 4 and 5. And uh, again, it, it is a challenge to cover uh, such a large a portion of scripture in just 45 minutes. Uh, so I encourage you to refer to the notes that are available online or through the church app. You can, you know, you can, uh, there's a lot more that will be in, that, that is in the notes. Uh, so you can study these in detail and some of the things I might just uh, skip over. And uh, it's, it's just for the sake of brevity to be able to complete uh, this in 45 minutes. So Paul's letter to the Romans, we, he was writing to the church in Rome that had both Jewish, uh, that had believers who were both Jewish and Gentile backgrounds, right? So they came from this mixed background. Paul was writing to them. And like we said, this is a, a, a wonderful explanation, a wonderful presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it also describes our own spiritual journey, right from coming to know Christ and then on. So it is wonderful to study it chapter by chapter and see how, where God wants us to go in our spiritual journey. So in chapter 1, after all the introduction that Paul does, the main thing is this. Paul says that God has revealed himself to us in creation. The invisible attributes of God are made known to us in creation. So that none of us are without any excuse. None of us can say, oh, I didn't know God was there. So he begins with that. And then he begins to talk about the sinfulness of man. That even though we knew God, we didn't want to recognize him as God. We didn't want to glorify him as God. We didn't want to be thankful. But we wandered away from God doing our own sinful things. That was chapter 1. In chapter 2, Romans chapter 2. Paul addresses uh, the Jews primarily to challenge their thinking, to challenge their bias or their attitude towards the Gentiles. And he begins to say that, you know, uh, Jews, everybody is under sin, whether you're a Jew or whether you are a Gentile. And he, 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 in some way, he's also rebuking the Jews because he says, you know, you, you, you feel that you are the ones with the law and you can point to others and tell them what's right and what's wrong. But you don't realize that every time you tell somebody else what's right and wrong, you're going to be judged by that same thing. So he challenges them, right? the Jews. Another very interesting thing we see in chapter 2 is that of the conscience. He says, look, for people who have not heard the law... They have a law that's already working inside them. And what is that called? That's called the conscience. So even they cannot say, I didn't know what was right and wrong. Because God has put something inside every person. Kind of built it into you. Built in. <laughs> it works inside you. Your conscience telling you what's right, what's wrong. Now, of course, we did say that our mind, our understanding could be darkened. Our conscience could be uh, suppressed or it could be what the Bible calls seared. That means it's no longer functioning the way it's supposed to function. And, uh, it, you know, we could end up in that state. But chapter 2, he's saying all Jews, uh, whether you know the law, whether you don't know the law, we've all fallen short of God's standards. And then he continues that into chapter 3, where essentially he says, he concludes this, he, he brings it to that main point that he wants to drive at. That is, all the whole world stands guilty before God. That's it. That's the, the point that he was driving at. That's Romans 3 and verse 20. A whole world standing guilty before God. None of us have any excuse. So having brought us to that understanding, then he begins to unveil the good news. Verse 22 of Romans 3. He says, but we are justified freely by his grace. 
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That means, look, we've all sinned. We're unable to have salvation by our own works. But this is how God makes salvation available to all of us. It's freely by His grace through just believing in what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. That's how salvation becomes available. And he says, therefore, nobody can boast. Jew or Gentile, nobody can boast because this has been given to us as a free gift. So now we're going to pick up from there. We're going to go into chapter 4 and 5 today. Let's just give a little introduction to chapter 4, then we will go through it. In chapter 4, the main thing that Paul, now just, just to remind us, Paul didn't write in chapters and Chapter and verses, right? When I say chapter 4, it's just our reference. He didn't write, okay, let me break this into chapter 4 and chapter 5. He wrote it as one continuous letter, right? But for our reference, we are talking about chapter 4 and chapter 5. So in chapter 4, the main thing Paul drives at is he wants to consolidate this revelation that righteousness comes by faith because of God's grace. That's it. He wants to consolidate that. Right? He's brought us this far in our spiritual understanding and now he says, I, I want to let you know, this is the way it is. And this is the only way it is, whether it was in the Old Testament times or whether it's in the New Testament times. It's always been like this. That God has given righteousness by faith because of his grace. And in order to do that, he points to two patriarchs of the Jews. That means these were the two big names of their ancestry. First was Abraham, next was David. Now the Jews took a lot of pride in Abraham. They referred to Abraham as our father. Nobody else can call him that way. We come from Abraham. He's our father, Abraham. So they had a lot of pride in that. And Paul, he Basically goes about saying, even Abraham received righteousness by faith. Without, before the law and without circumcision. And without, he didn't do anything to earn it. He establishes that. And then he goes on to so, show that even David. David, the Jews once again took great pride in David. The king, the best king they ever had. King David. Even David received righteousness by faith. So he shows that from the Bible, from the Old Testament scriptures. And then he says, look, Abraham is not just the father of the Jews. He is the father of everyone, the whole world, everyone who will have faith. So once again, he dismantles their prejudice and their wrong notion that, oh no, Abraham is exclusively for us. No, he is the father of everyone who has faith. You with me so far? Just a little summary of that chapter 4. And as he goes about that in chapter 4, he also takes us on a side journey. You know, many modern preachers go off on side journeys. <laughs> Sometimes so many side journeys, you don't know what the main journey is. Right? <laughs> so Paul goes off on a side journey. A little side journey in Romans chapter 4. Just to give us insight into how Abraham walked in faith in God. And that's very important because we all learn how to walk in faith. And then he comes back to his main points, right? So let's read chapter 4, go through it together. Right, Romans chapter 4, you can see the notes up on your screen. Wow, is it big enough to read? Okay, all right. Romans chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. So he says, look, Abraham, our father. Now he can say our father because he was, he was Jewish. And he says, you know, what did he get in his life? Did he get righteousness by works? Now, Abraham, you know, verse 2, if he was justified by works, he might have had something to boast, but he could definitely not boast before God. But that's not the case. He wasn't justified by works. And he reads, he points to Genesis 15 verse 6 where he says, Abraham believed God and that was accounted to him for? So he's quoting from the Old Testament. 
Look, the Old Testament is saying, Abraham believed God. And that was accounted to him for rights. That means he did not get it by works. He only got it simply by believing. And that word accounted is a very interesting word. It's interesting uh, uh, because Paul uses it very often in his episodes. In fact, in chapter 4 alone, he uses it 11 times. It is translated accounted, counted, reckoned, imputed. But it's the same Greek word. And it's an accounting word. It means literally to be counted into your account. This is counted. In, or in modern language, you would say it's been credited to you, your account. Or it's been deposited in your account. So Abraham believed God and God deposited to him. Right. That's all. He just believed God. He didn't work for it. He believed God. God said, okay, here's it. Righteousness is in your account. It's yours. He credited into him uh, in response to him simply believing. Verse 4. Now to, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So now Paul suddenly br brings up this word grace. He says, look, if you're working, then what's given to you is not something by grace. It's something you have earned. If it's by your works. Right? And that word grace is very important. In the New Testament, that word grace, depending on the context, can mean divine favor. Or it can mean divine empowering. Or it can mean divine character. Right? But in this context, grace is favor. That means God just favors you. Not because we deserve it. Not because we've earned it but because of the goodness of his own heart. So favor is us receiving from God, not what we deserve, but what he gives to us out of the goodness of his own heart. Favor, grace. Somebody put it like this, and you probably heard it before. Grace stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. So God's riches, Christ paid it, you get it. You and I get it. Grace, right? So he says, look, uh, if you work for it, then you can't say it's grace. So it's not by grace. Verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. That means if you don't work for it, but you just believe, then in response to your believing, God gives you righteousness. That is is grace. Right? And think about this. It says there, God, him who justifies the ungodly. Think about that. God is holy, but he's still able to make the unholy righteous. Call you and me righteous. God can do it. Because Jesus paid the price. Right? Verse 6. Go on. Now he's pointing to David. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So he's quoting from Psalm 32. And if you read Psalm 32, the Psalm of David, you'll find that David simply acknowledges his sin before God and he receives forgiveness. So even David received forgiveness, not by works, but simply going before God. And so Paul once again points to David and says, look at David. What did he say? Blessed is the man whose sin is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And God just gives, imputes righteousness apart from works. He credits righteousness without works. Are you with me? Now this is very important. Now you see, in our, in our modern setting, we may not be struggling with the law or with circumcision, but we struggle with the lots of do's and don'ts that we ourselves put up. Eh? If I read my Bible one hour, then God is happy with me. <laughs> or if I do such and such. Now, we create our own rules. But I want us to understand as we progress in this to just embrace grace. Receive it. Ex 
accept it. And then whatever we do, we do out of honor to God. Amen? Not to earn something, but because we want to honor Him, because we want to love Him. Out of that, we live holy. We do all the other things. We read our Bibles. We pray. We don't do it to earn, but we do it. We've already received grace, but now out of honor, out of love, um, because we want a relationship and grow in that, we read our Bibles. We do whatever we want. So keep this in mind. Today, the church struggles with man-made rules, ideas that we put on ourselves, uh, and they were struggling with the law and with uh, other you know, things like circumcision and so on. So as we are, uh, go through this, just keep that in mind. Now verse 9. So verses 9, in verse 9 through 12, Paul addresses another thing. The issue of circumcision. It says, does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Now, now he's dealing with the second issue of circumcision. He says, you know, I want to ask you something. Did God pronounce Abraham righteous because he was circumcised? He says, no, 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 no. Look at it carefully. Look at the Old Testament scriptures carefully. God in Genesis 15 said, Abraham, because you believe in me, I am declaring you righteous. Only later on in chapter 17 does God come and introduce circumcision as a sign of his covenant with Abraham. So the point is this, that Abraham received righteousness by faith even before and even without circumcision. So the Jews who again took so much pride in the fact that they were circumcised was a sign of their covenant with God. He was saying, hey, that no longer holds. Because righteousness by faith is available to all who have this one common denominator, and that is who all who believe. Whether they are circumcised or not, all who believe receive this gift of righteousness. Are you with me so far? And therefore he says, he shocks them with this statement in, uh, in verse, uh, verse, verse 12. He says, uh, he is the father uh, sorry, verse 11, and that, that he might be the father of all who believe. So the real access to Abraham is that you believe. He's a father of all who believe, not just the Jews. You can't claim exclusivity to him anymore. All who believe become his spiritual descendants, is what he's saying here. Let's read on, verse 13 to 16. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to a seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So now he's addressing the second issue of the law. So first circumcision, he dealt with that. Now he's saying law. That means Abraham got righteousness outside of the law. Verse 14. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So he's saying, look, if God gave this promise to Abraham as part of the law, or because he fulfilled the law, then... That promise is of no effect. And if only those who were under the law could claim uh, this for themselves. Faith is of no effect. The promise is of no effect. 
Because the promise that God gave Abraham was a promise that through you, the whole nation, all nations will be blessed. So the promise was all nations will be blessed. But if now you say only those who practice the law can have that promise, then that, that promise is no longer valid. So he says, no, that is not the issue. The issue is you have to have faith. It's faith, grace. So that Abraham is the father of all who walk in the steps of that faith. Right? So it's not by the law. It's by faith. Are you with me? Right? That's the point he's getting at. Right? Righteousness without the law. Righteousness outside of circumcision. It's all through believing in God. That's the point he has established so far. And he says, uh, I'm skipping over some, some explanation there for verse uh, 14, uh, verse 14, 15. You can get it to the notes where we explain, you know, what does he mean by saying where there is no law, there is, uh, where there is no law, there is no transgression. So really, it doesn't mean that if there is no law, there is no sin. No, where there is no law, there is no understanding our recognition of transgression. The word transgression means crossing over a line that you should not cross over. So if there is no law, then you don't know that you've actually crossed over a line. Now, you have crossed over a line. You have sinned. You have done wrong. But you don't know it. And that's what he's, he's mentioning. He's not saying that there is no sin outside the law. But now, verses 17 to 21, he takes this little side journey to talk to us about the faith that Abraham had. But I want to highlight four key words that he has presented to us so far. Faith, righteousness, grace, and promise. And this is how God works in each of our lives. All right? Let's say this together. Faith, righteousness, grace, promise. Four important words. Faith is what we, we have faith in God. We believe God. Second, righteousness. It is what God gives to us. Our right standing with him. But he gives righteousness by grace. Now once we're engaging with God in faith, righteousness and grace. What happens? He, exp he reveals his promise for each one of us. Okay? There's a promise that God wants to fulfill. What God wants to accomplish in our lives. For Abraham the promise was. I will make you the father of a great nation. The promise to you. Something different. Faith, righteousness, grace, common for all of us. We engage with God through faith, righteousness, and grace. But then each one of us has a promise for our lives. I would say it's God's purpose. It's God's plan. It's the, there are written promises, but there are personal promises. Things for your life. And so now he begins to show to us in the next few verses, verses 17 to 21, how... Abraham, having had faith in God, received righteousness by grace, how he journeyed into the promise. And he has preceded this by telling us we must walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham. So this passage is very important. Even though it's a side, uh, little side tour that he's taking, it's very important for us to understand how you and I will journey into the promises that God has for our lives. How do we journey into it? There are personal promises that God has put inside you for your life. There are written promises that, that you can take a hold of uh, from the word of God. Whether it's for your life, for your, your family, your marriage, your profession, your career, whatever. There are written promises. But how do you and I journey into seeing those promises fulfilled. We all begin the same way. Faith, righteousness, and grace. But the promise, how do we journey into it? Here's how he explains it to us. Verses 17 to 21. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. That, is, that was a promise to Abraham. In the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Who contrary to hope, in hope believe, so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Verse 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. 
Verse 20, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. So let's look closely at the steps of the faith of Abraham. Verse 17, the first one is looking at God and who he is. That's how Abraham began. It says, verse 17, God gave him a promise. You're going to be the father of many, of many nations. Father of a nation. And it says, before him whom he believed. He believed before God. So first thing. When you want to journey into your promise. Look at God. He is the one who is giving you the promise. Amen. So tap your neighbor to wake him up. And tell them, it's God who gave you the promise. Right. It's not your pastor. Thank God. <laughs> because, hey, your pastor is not going to be able to fulfill that promise. He's just the man. But the promise came from God. He is the promise giver. So when, when you take a hold of the promise, whether it's a written promise or something God has spoken to you, you look at God. He is the giver of that promise. And what, is, what else does it say about God? It says that God gives life to the dead. So that's the way God works. He gives life to the dead. Now you and I... Now, you know, there may be areas in, in our lives where we said, this is dead. Nothing can happen here. It's beyond hope. Uh, it's, it's lifeless. It's gone. The funeral is over. Everything is gone. But God gives life to the... That means there is nothing in your life that God can't bring back to life. Nothing is that dead that God says, whoops, this is even too hard for me. No. God can do something in that area of your life. That's the giver of the promise. And the other aspect of the giver of the promise is this. God calls things that do not exist as though they did. Now you and I got, have to get used to that. Because you and I are only used to what exists right now. Oh, look at that. There's no money in the bank. Or oh, look at that. Things are so bad, so broken. Or oh, look at that. The sickness is so devastating. No, we can only see what exists. But what does the Bible say? God calls things that do not exist. So when he gives you a promise, that promise is many times like this. He talks about giving life to what is dead. He talks about bringing into your life what doesn't exist. So God, sorry, I can't figure this out. But look at the giver of the promise. Amen? Look at the giver of the promise. Who is he? He is God. He's the God who gives life to the dead. He's the God who brings into existence what does not exist. And that's the way God started off with Abraham. He gave him a promise in an area where Abraham probably had done the funeral many times over. Gone. He's closed that chapter of his life. It's an area of his life where Abraham says, this will never exist in my life. And God says, hello, I'm giving you a promise that's going to give life to what is dead, which is going to bring something in that does not exist. And Abraham had to look at God because he was the giver of the promise. One less, first, first one. Always keep your eyes on the giver of the promise. Second, how did Abraham journey into the promise? The next thing we see, verse 18. Against all hope, he still believed in hope. I mean, there was no reason even to hope. I mean, it was beyond being hopeless. There was no reason to but he still believed in hope. See, this is something important. Believe the promise. Believe the promise. Even when there is no reason to hope. Believe. That's what Abraham did. Against all hope, he believed. In hope. Now, hope is very important. 
if you don't have hope, you can't have faith. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. So first you got to have hope. But hope is easy because you and I can dream. Hope is having a dream. It's painting on the canvas of your imagination a distant future and what things could be like. Hope. But it's very important. Don't lose hope. That little flicker of hope, keep it burning. It's very important. right? At least in your mind's eye. At least in your imagination. See what things could be like. Dream about it. There's nothing wrong. God gave you your imagination. Keep it holy, but dream. Amen. See that promise being fulfilled in your life. It could be a written promise. It could be something God spoken to you. Fine. But you hope. Hope is a seeing a desired outcome. You're able to go into your future in your mind's eye and see it. Don't let the devil rob you of your hope because if you lose hope, you can't have faith. So hope. Oh, paint that picture. Keep it. Lie down in your bed and dream. Wow, God. This is how it's going to be. Amen? That's easy to do. But for some of us, even that might also be difficult because things can be so devastating in our lives that you can't even get yourself to venture there. But I want to encourage you. Hope. Paint that picture of what things could be like. Dream. Because then... You can have faith towards that. Right? So against all hope, he still believed in hope. Verse 19. He did not, and be, not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead. So 19, he did not let his faith be weakened by the facts. So Abraham didn't deny the facts. He knew the facts. I mean, he's 90. Wife, Sarah, is already old. Oh, I don't you know, she's been barren right from beginning. No chance of having children. So he didn't deny the facts. But he didn't let the facts weaken his faith. That's very important. As we make our journey in faith, don't let the facts weaken your faith. Keep having faith in God. So you have hope, now you have faith towards that. God, I believe towards that. I'm believing. Faith, believing, that's almost synonymous. Except that believing is a verb, faith is a noun. Faith brings you there. Uh, believing brings you there. It's something you do inside you. Believe, have faith. Don't let the facts weaken your faith. I'm not saying deny the facts. You know what the facts are. But don't let it weaken your faith in God. Another thing he did, verse 20. He did not waver on God's promise through unbelief. Verse 20. That means unbelief came knocking on the door. Hello, Abraham. He opened the door a little bit. Closed the door. He didn't let unbelief get in. Didn't let unbelief weaken his faith. But you know, doubts will come knocking. And if you actually look at the life of Abraham... You see, he did have doubts. In fact, in Genesis 15, he tried to help God out. He said, God, I know you've given me this promise, but maybe you need my help. How can it be, O oh God? Maybe it's supposed to work out like this. So he's trying to help God. So did Abraham walk, had, have moments of unbelief? Yes, he did. Did Sarah have moments of unbelief? Yes. She even laughed at God's promise. She had to repent of that afterwards. So did they have moments of unbelief? Yes. But somehow he picked himself up. He did not let unbelief cause him to fall, waver at the promise of God. You can have doubts in your head. And still maintain faith in your heart. Because the devil is going to try to play mind games. 
So that can happen. Doubts banging on your head. But don't lose the faith that's in your heart. Questions will come. But don't let it cause you to lose your faith in God. Verse 20. Second part of it. He became strong in faith as he gave glory to God. So he was strengthened in faith. And we all need that process of being strengthened in our faith. So we don't go from, you know, level zero to level 10 just because you decided to. No, it's a process. It's a journey. He was strengthened in faith. Or his faith became stronger, stronger. What did he do? He gave glory to God. He began to praise God. So there are many ways that you, you can strengthen your faith. Through the word and by giving glory to God. Or by praising God. You begin to praise God for the result even before you see it. You begin to thank God for it. So sometimes we, we pray like this and some people don't understand it. I mean, maybe, you know, just an example. Maybe, um, you know, uh, let's say. There's no money in your bank, but you're praising God. Father, I thank you for the money you've blessed me with. And you're like, what is this guy saying? <laughs> There's no money. What are you doing? You're, you're being strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. That means you're thanking God even without seeing that. But that is faith. Now, some people who don't know faith will not understand that. They think you Something happens. <laughs> but Abraham was strengthened in faith as he gave glory to God. Just thank God. Lord, thank you. Isaac wasn't born yet. But God, thank you. He gave glory to God. He gave praise to God. And that strengthened his faith. So we learned that from Abraham. And verse 21. He was fully convinced that, what, that God will do what he had promise. So this was a journey. You know, we are looking at a 25-year journey summarized in five verses. Okay, so this didn't happen overnight. 25 years of Abraham's journey of faith summarized to us in these few verses. And he finally came to this place where he was fully convinced that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. So you and I will make that journey. So God, I know you will do it. Nothing can shake me now. But it took him a while to come to that place. Amen? So don't worry if you don't find yourself in great perfect faith right now. Don't worry. Abraham made that journey. You and I make that journey. That's why we walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham. We are making this journey. We're coming to that place where we can be fully convinced that what God has promised, He will also perform in our lives. Amen? Are you with me so far? So that was a little side journey. And then he comes back to the main point. We'll read the last few verses of chapter 4. And therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. So that's the same point. Like, okay, he had faith. This is how he had faith. And now God says, I am declaring you righteous. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. That means all of this is for us as well. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So now he's talking about us, we who believe that we will also have righteousness credited to our account because we believe and it will be done by grace. You're with me so far? Amen? All right, don't worry, I'm not letting you go. So. <laughs> Verse 25 is very important because now Paul transitions into something very important, which we will use, you know, people use the word identification uh, to talk about this. And he begins to expound on this in chapter 5. Let's read Romans 4, verse 25. He's talking about Jesus, our Lord Jesus, from the, who raised up Jesus from the dead, verse 25 who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. So what is he talking about? Jesus, who was sinless, was delivered. That word delivered is a judicial word, which is talking about 
to sentence as guilty, to be sent to prison, to be condemned as a sinner. Jesus was delivered because of our offenses. So he was identified with our wrongdoing. And he says he was raised up, resurrected, again, because of our justification. That means God found that the price was paid in full. Okay, now I can justify all these people. Jesus, you can be raised from the dead. So, he was identified with our sins, put to death. We were identified with his righteousness. And he was raised up from the dead. Are you with me? You see that? Identification. That's important because he's going to develop this further. Let's get into chapter 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. So, in these three verses, in these four verses rather, chapter 5, verse 1 to 4, Paul is talking about the outcome. Therefore, having been justified by faith. So now, he's saying, okay guys, this matter is over. Remember, we have been justified by faith. Now I'm going to progress, take you further in your spiritual journey. Having been justified by faith, what happens? Four things. Number one. We have peace with God. So say this out with me. I have peace with God. That means, you know, you and God are not fighting each other. God is not your problem. God is not your enemy. We have peace with God. Because we have been justified by. That means we are in a right relationship with God. We can talk to him freely as friends. We are peace with God. Having been justified by faith. We are peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Second. Verse 2. Having access by faith. Into this grace in which we stand. So here's the second thing. You are in a place of grace. So let's say this together. I am in a place of grace. Or you can say it like this. I'm standing in grace. That means you're standing in a place where when God looks at you, you're totally favored in his eyes. Favored in his eyes. Why? Because you've been justified freely by his grace. So you are standing in grace. Now this is very important. Now in the New Testament... Uh, to explain the standing in grace, there are several things you'll find. I've just listed some of them in the, in the, in the, in the, in the notes. Uh, we are beloved of God. We are covered with His love. We are well-pleasing in His eyes. Uh, we are faultless in His eyes. We are blessed with every blessing from heaven. Uh, we are qualified, made fit in Jesus. So this is our standing in grace. Now this is very important. Because everything you and I must do in our life must flow out of this position of grace. Do you understand that? When you pray, you pray out of your standing in grace. God, I am already favored in your eyes. I am pleasing to you. How did we come into this place? How did we come into this place of grace? By faith. We have access by faith. Verse 2. It's by faith we've come in. Just believed in Jesus Christ. He's put us in this place of grace. That means when you're praying, you're, it's not, like I said earlier, it's not a work to earn favor. No, you're play, praying out of a place of favor. 
So you're not going to say, oh God, please share me if you want to. If you don't want to, I will call somebody else. Hey, you, you believer, you are in a place of grace. So pray. Knowing your prayers are being heard. When you do ministry or serving God for something, you're not serving God to earn His grace. You are already in a place of grace. You're standing in grace. But you're serving God because you love Him. You want to honor Him. You're thankful for all He's done. You want to, you know, further His kingdom. You're serving because of that, not in order to earn something. I understand it. As believers, this must be strong in us. That we are in a place of grace. I'm standing in grace. Third thing. It says, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That means we have this joy in us. That we are going to experience the glory of God. Part of it is, I'm going to be with him in heaven. I'm going to be in his presence, in his glory. So we rejoice with that hope we have because we've been justified by faith. And the fourth thing has to do with our life here on earth. We rejoice also in tribulation, having to sit through one hour of a sermon. (laughs) Oh, what a tribulation. (laughs) We rejoice in our tribulations. Knowing this, why can we be joyful even in our tribulations. Why? Knowing this, that our that tribulation develops endurance. Endurance builds character, and character reinforces the hope we have. See that we've got to be people of hope. But how can you be a person of hope? Well, when you go through some difficult situations and you still come out with it you go through it still coming out having hope what has happened to you one it has developed your endurance you know you cannot run um, let's say you cannot be a distance runner if you don't run the distance you just can't you can't do a hundred meter dash and say I can run 1500 doesn't work that way Now, when I used to train in college, I used to run five kilometers in order to compete in 1,500s. That means you do multiply times the distance you're competing for in order to run that race. You don't do less than that. You don't run 800 to compete in 1,500s. It won't work. (laughs) You run five kilometers in order to compete in 1,500s. That's it. That's how you, you, you build endurance. Build it. So it says, tribulation develops endurance. Endurance builds character. We all need that. And then, when you have that character, you have hope. Hope. Verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame. Why? Why? That means this hope that we have is not a meaningless hope and that one day we're going to hold our faces down in shame. No. Why? This hope will not put us to shame. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That means right now, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we are experiencing the love that God has for us. Amen? You know, this is very important. We need to experience the love that God has for us. To know that we are loved by God. And and, and that he loves us so much. And the next few verses, Paul explains this love of God. He says, you know, for scarcely for a righteous man would anyone die. But maybe for a good man somebody may die. But while we were still ungodly, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God, verse 8, God commends his love towards us. God demonstrates, he reveals, he puts on display. God commends his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What he's saying is this, you know, 
For a good man, nobody will give his life. But maybe for a very, very noble man, for a very extraordinary man, maybe somebody will give up their life for that kind of a person. But you know what God did? He loved us so much that while you were still ungodly, verse 6, and while you were still a sinner, verse 8, Christ died for us. And this is the kind of love that we are experiencing in our hearts. The love of God is poured into our hearts. The Holy Spirit is the one who's going to give us that revelation of the love of God. And you know, if you and I have never experienced the love of God, ask Him, God, I want to experience this love that you have for me. It can bring healing. It can do so much in our hearts and lives. The love that God has for us. And so because of all this that has happened, We're building endurance here. <laughs> Verse 9 to 11. Don't worry, we'll finish up fast. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, to the death of his son, so much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we shall also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation so what is he saying now he's saying look we have been reconciled to god to reconcile means to change enemies to friends now think what god did you know suppose you had a friend who owed you a lot of money who mistreated you ill-treated you falsely accused you was angry with you i mean he was just very mean person to you but if you go to him now most of us would say just forget it leave him alone don't even go close to him. But to such a friend, if you go to him and say, hey, I know all this has happened, but I'm canceling, forget the debt, forget all that you've done, let's be friends. That's what God did. Right? We owed huge debts. We did all, we were enemies with God. And you know, God reaches down to us. He pays our debt on the cross. And he says, come, let's be friends. That's how much he values relationship with you and me. That's how much. And that's what Paul is saying. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God to the death of his son. God did it for us so that we could have Reconciliation. Now, in the next few verses, starting from verse 12 on through verse 19, Paul contrasts Adam and Christ. He contrasts Adam and Christ. Now, I also want to refer to a parallel passage in 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to do this quickly so that uh, we can dismiss in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 to 48, you see a parallel passage. Let me try to summarize these two together. I'm not reading this entire passage, but let me summarize. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 48, we see something very interesting. Adam is called the first Adam. Jesus is not called second Adam. Jesus is called the last Adam. Now, when a certain species is going to die out, they say, this is the last snow leopard we have. Once this last dies, that species is extinct. You know, Adam's race technically is because Jesus is not the second Adam. He is the last Adam. Jesus came to make Adam's race extinct. Last. Now, he was not born of Adam's race, but he came to put an end to that. The second thing you find there in, in 1 Corinthians 14, 45 to 48 is this. Adam is called the first man. Jesus is called the second man. There are only two men who ever lived this world. <laughs> Adam, Jesus. First man, second man. So here's this. You and I are in Christ. In Christ, we are set free from Adam's race. 
that race, as far as you and I are concerned, in Christ, that's extinct. It's gone. Your identity is no longer in Adam. The last Adam came and died. And in Christ, you and I are part of the second man, the new man, the new creation. We are not of the first man. We are of the second. You understand? Right? So in Christ, Adam's race or Adam's flow in your life is broken. In Christ, you are a new man, second man, of the second man, not the first man, of the second man. When you keep that thought in mind, you go read Romans 5, 12 through 19. Basically, what Paul is saying there is this. Through one man, Adam, sin came into this world. Death passed on all men. That resulted in condemnation. But through Jesus comes abundance of grace. The gift of righteousness and the ability to reign in life. That is a summary of those verses. Adam put us under. He made us subject to death, sin, death, and everything that come came out of that. Jesus came, gave us abundance of grace, the gift of righteousness. And he says, now you will reign in life. You will have dominion over everything. Adam put you under. Are you with me? So here's the fourth point I want to make. In the life we live now, don't draw your identity from Adam. Draw it from Jesus. Don't say, I am of Adam's race. No, no, no. You are of the second man. You're of Jesus. Learn to think that way. When you think of Adam's race, we think of, oh, I'm, I have to be under sin. I have to do what is wrong. This is it. But think about what Christ did for you. He brought abundance of grace. More grace than you need. He brought you the gift of righteousness and he gave you the ability to reign in life. So any situation you face in life, you look at it from who you are in Christ. I'm going to reign. I'm going to rise up above this situation. I'm going to overcome. If I think as like Adam, I would say I'm under this. But if I think as of in Christ, I will overcome because I reign in life. And the last few verses of chapter 5, he says, As sin reigned in death, verse 21. Where, verse 20, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that, so that as sin reigned in death, grace might reign through righteousness in Jesus Christ. Meaning you and I are in a place where grace reigns. Grace outdoes what sin devastated. God un, un, just totally un, undid the work of sin by his grace. We are in this reign of grace where grace rules in our lives. So, having understood this so far, as Paul progresses in chapter 6, 7, and 8, he deals with the issue of sin in the life of the believer. Now that we've been justified, we're right with God, we have received grace, we're now no longer in subjection to Adam's line, we're off Christ. How about the sin in our lives? How do we get rid of sin? That amazing revelation in 6, 7, and 8, he unfolds, and we'll get into that next Sunday. So if you can, before you come next Sunday, read chapter 6, 7, and 8. So we'll try to condense that together really quickly. Thank you. Your tribulation is over. You may rise. <laughs> Let's pray. Let's pray together. I want you to take some time just to thank God. Thank Him that He would give righteousness by faith. That's, that's amazing. That just because you have faith in Jesus Christ, what He did for us on the cross, He would give us righteousness. Thank Him that we have this standing in grace. Nothing we did brought us in here. We just believed. And we are in this place of grace. It's available to every person. Thank him that you and I could enjoy it today. And that we can go about telling others of the same thing. Thank him that you belong to the second man. Jesus. 
that what came off Adam is broken off your life. And you have what comes through Jesus Christ. And Holy Spirit, I welcome you to give each one of us an experience of the Father's love. That the love of God will be poured in our hearts and we will experience it deep inside. That we will know that we know that we know that we are loved by God. And nothing can shake that. And Father, we pray that because your word has been spoken, Father, I ask that right now, because of the grace of God, because of the finished work of Christ, that sickness, disease, every work of the devil over our lives be broken. In the name of Jesus, I take authority over every evil work, harassing our minds, tormenting our bodies, oppressing the minds, every foul spirit of uncleanness, every spirit of infirmity. I take authority over you and I command you, come out, go, release the minds of people, release the bodies of people. And because of the finished work of Christ on the cross, I command healing, wholeness, well-being. Thank you, O God, for your abundant grace and the work that grace does in our lives. Thank you. Before we dismiss, if there's anyone here and you would like to receive Jesus Christ into your life, maybe it's the first time you understood these things and you say, I want to receive Jesus. I want to lead you in a simple prayer so that Jesus Christ can come into your life, forgive your sins, become your Savior and Lord, and that you can enjoy personally everything we've been talking about. If you've never done this, I want to lead you in a simple prayer right now. Would you pray this with me, please, if you've never done this before? Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive my sins. Make me a child of God. And bring me into this place of grace. And help me to walk by faith in you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.